All right, folks, Hebrews 13 is our reading for this morning. Hebrews 13. Today we're going to bring to close uh, our study in the book of Hebrews uh, that uh, uh, we began quite a while ago. And uh, we're just going to concentrate our thoughts on verses 20 and 21 and just briefly mention from 22 down to verse 25. But uh, the idea is that we finish our, our study and all that we've been learning through the epistle to the Hebrews today. And uh, Next Lord day, day, God willing, we will begin a new series on the prophecy of Jeremiah, which will be exciting for me because I've never heard anybody preach on Jeremiah. So it'll be new to me too. So um, I pray that God will bless us as we go through that book uh, over the next few months. So, But Hebrews 13 and verse 20 is where we're reading just now. And the word of God says this, now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. And we'll end our reading there at verse number 25. Now, let's just again quieten our hearts and pray for ourselves and please pray for me as we... Uh, Get ready to hear God's word. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, every one of us need to hear from you this morning. And that is our prayer. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Imagine for a moment you're on holidays... Imagine you're off in a foreign land. You don't speak the language and uh, you don't know the customs. You're just there for a visit. You're just there for a good time. You're just there for a break. But on holidays, the, the police break through the door and you're arrested. You're taken away to a police station. You have no idea what has happened. You've just been going about your business. You've just been enjoying your holidays. But you are suddenly incarcerated. And people are in charge of your destiny. And you can't understand what's going on. You have no context in which to place this event. And you have no way of comprehending what is being said and what is going to happen. You can just imagine the panic that would rise in your heart, the worry, the fear, the concern that would all be raging within you. And what would your hope be? Well, your hope would be that you'd be able to phone the British consulate. Your hope would be that they would be able to send somebody who could help you understand, that they could send someone to help you guide you through what was going on. And the sad thing is you might be disappointed at what they're able to do. As you think on this scenario for a moment and the awfulness of it, what do we think about when trouble comes into our lives as Christians? As men and women of God, what does it mean when, when, when we're not sure what's going on? When we are not equipped to understand what's happening next or why this is happening to us at this time? We do not call on the consulate of heaven and hope that a helper will be sent to us. No, the wonderful thing is that as Christians, if we are in times of trouble, when we get into times of trouble, and we will, remember in this passage, Timothy has just been released from prison. He has known times of trouble. We call out to someone different. We call out to the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know that in him we have Peace. We know that he is able to do what others cannot do. That he is the one 
who will enter into our situation and help us in ways that no one else can. And it seems to me this is what the writer to the epistle of the Hebrews is ending his epistle with. Remember, he's been communicating with people who are finding the way difficult. They are Christians. They are people who have put their trust in Jesus and they have come out of Judaism and entered into Christianity. But because of circumstances, because of the conversations of others, because of false teachers who have entered into their lives, they are in doubt and in turmoil. They're confused about what they have in Jesus Christ. They're confused about what God has done in them. And the writer has written this epistle to encourage them to see Jesus as he really is, to look to him again and see that he is all that they need. He has written to them to encourage them to walk with God, to purpose in their hearts, to do what God has told them, to live in the way that Christ has told them and refuse to be turned back. He has told them to live as a family, to support one another, to encourage one another, to help one another because of their common ancestry, because they are the children of God through salvation, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And now as all of that information is roaming about in their hearts and lives, now as they're thinking about all the things that they have been taught, he prays for them, and he prays for the God of peace to come into their experience, for the God of peace to make all these things that he has taught them come alive to them and be their reality in the days to come. And that's what we want to think about this morning, we want to think about the God of peace at work in us. The God of peace who comes and brings peace in our turmoil, peace in our distress. He allows us to go through the most difficult of circumstances, confident that our God is in control and that He is with us wherever we go. The first question I want to ask is, why the God of peace? Why pray to the God of peace? Why use this particular name in the opening to his prayer? Now may the God of peace. Well, the writer understands what his audience is going through, doesn't he? He has gone through it step by step. He has gone through all of the different elements that are that are causing consternation in the lives of these men and women. And he invokes the name of the God of peace because he knows that information is not enough. That information is not what it's all about. It's not about facts and figures. It's not about programs. It's about God being at work in his people. This is how we have peace. And he knows that if these men and women are to have their hearts settled. Remember, their hearts are full of contradicting thoughts about who they are and about what they're going to do next. Remember, the people around them, family members, friends, and teachers who have entered into the church have been starting to speak to them and taking their hearts and their minds away from the Lord Jesus. Remember, there is conflict going on. Because when there's confusion about what we believe, then conflict is the inevitable outcome. And if they are going to find peace, they need God to come. They don't need a, they don't need a committee. They don't need a, a, a program of this or that. They need God to come into their experience. They need the God of peace to come and to speak to them and to be with them because their God is the God of peace. Our God is the God of peace. Right from the beginning, that's who God revealed himself to be, isn't it? Because the very beginning of the gospel reminds us that at one time we were at war with God. These people were at war with God. They were ensconced in their own lives, in their own religion, in their own way of life. And God came in and said, no, you're not okay. You're at war with me. Sin has made you rebellious against me. Your sin shows that your hearts are far from me. And God came in, Christ came in, and he gave them peace by settling the debt. 
Remember, earlier on in Hebrews, we re re read those words. You know, he, he, he made one sacrifice for sins forever. Jesus was the one who provided them with peace, not just for a moment, but forever. You see, their God, the one they worship, the Jesus whom they serve, is their defense from spiritual confusion. He's their antidote to doubt and to fear. He's the one who gives them peace. He's the one who answers their prayers whenever things are difficult. Whenever the way is hard, whenever the way is confusing, the God of peace is the one who draws near to his people and settles their hearts. You see, we need the God of peace. We need the God of peace to come and to work. We need the God of peace because there is conflict between man and humanity. The same that was true of the, the Hebrews before they were saved is true of our world today. We live in a world that is in conflict with God. We sin. We are against God. That is our default setting. And we were at conflict between God. God is angry because we are sinning. And we are sinning willfully and happily. And we need God to come and make peace. We need Christ to come and make peace between us and God. Otherwise, there will never be peace. We live in a world that's not only in conflict with God, we live in a world that is in conflict with itself. All you have to do is look around you and you look at the politics of today and we see people at war with one another. People not knowing what to believe. People not knowing what to do. People trying to pursue their own ends at the expense of others. People trying to fix everybody's problems but creating more. We live in a world where reality is denied. What's simple and straightforward is said not to exist. And as long as that is the case, there will be conflict. Because reality and theory cannot conf conf conflict forever. People do not know what they can and cannot say. People are confused about what is right to say and what is wrong to say, what is appropriate at this situation and the other. And there's conflict between freedom and the ability to be who you are. We live in a world that is confused, don't we? Years ago, we were fighting against segregation. Now people are fighting for segregation. It's a strange world. It's a strange that is not at peace with itself. That there are all sorts of groups and all sorts of uh, ideas and all sorts of people. And as they seek to move forward with their agenda, they're creating war. Even those who have the agenda of peace. We live in a world that needs peace. That needs the God of peace to come and to work. But it's not only within the world. There is conflict within the hearts of men and women in the church of Jesus Christ, isn't there? We fight over secondary theological issues. Not important theological issues. We're not fighting about the deity of the Lord Jesus. We're not fighting, well, not so much about penal substitution and Christ dying for our sins. But we fight over secondary issues about when we believe the Lord will come and how or where. We fight over our ecclesiology about the way the church works. We fight over all sorts of things. There's conflict within the church. There's conflict um, in us as believers because in some ways we have taken on the ideas of the world. Many Christians today are confused about what it means to be a Christian. They think, well, to be a Christian is to say, I believe in Jesus and then I can live as I want. I can work out life as I, uh, as I go along and I don't have to worry about being, uh, or obeying his commands or doing what he has said because I am a Christian. And as long as I have prayed that prayer, as long as I have asked Jesus into my heart, well, it doesn't matter how I live. They're confused about what it means to be a Christian. Some people are confused about what Christ has promised. Many Christians believe, well, if I'm a Christian and I do good things, then God will make sure that my life is easy. 
You know, if as long as I get things right, as long as I do dot every I and cross every T, then it's God's obligation to make my life as simple and straightforward as possible. And we're in danger of thinking that even in our service today because we could think of peace as removing all conflict and that's not what we're talking about. And there are many people within the church of Jesus Christ who think that if trouble comes into their lives, then Christ has failed. Christ has let them down. He hasn't upheld his part of the bargain. Or perhaps they go into themselves and start thinking, well, I haven't done everything right, therefore God uh, won't bless me. Many people in the church of Jesus Christ are confused about what God is doing in our world. What's God's purpose in our world? Is God's purpose in our world to make everybody love each other? No. To make everything, make everything just go along, drift along. He's there to provide our, for our needs, to give us what we want, to make us happy. And if he make, makes us happy and gives us what we want, then he is doing what he should do and he is worthy of our worship and our praise. That's not what God has come to do. That's not what God does in our world. Our God is out for his glory. Our God is here to lift himself up in the eyes of people so that they will be drawn to him, so he can save a people for himself, so he can save a people who will put their faith in him and go to be with him forever. And if we don't understand that, if we think God is here for, everything, for all these other things, then we're missing the point. The truth is today, we need the God of peace to come into our lives, into our world. To save people from the, the sin that captures them. To come into our world and change our minds. And to come into our world and change us as Christians so that we are following him. And that is why the writer to the Hebrews prays this prayer. Because he knows his audience needs to know and experience the work of the God of peace if they are to live for him. And we need that very experience as well. That's why we pray for the God of peace. That's why we use this as a benediction in our services. Because we need the God of peace. Why do we need the God of peace? Well, it's because of who he is. We have the powerful presence of the God of peace. Let's read verse 20 again. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. You see, the God of peace has been invoked. The prayer is to the one who brings peace to the world between man and God and between man and man. And he does it because he is the God who is powerfully present for those who call on him. Where do we see his power? Well, we see his power in the work that he did. He brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. And here we see the power of our God. Here our God is the life-giving God. He is the one who raises from the dead. He is the one who does what no one else can do. You call the man from the consulate, you call the woman from the consulate, and all she can do is work within the laws that she, that, of the country that she is in. But when we call on God, when we call on the God of peace, we call to the one who can raise from the dead, who causes life where there was only death. Who brings hope when there was only despair. He is the one who can do what we cannot do. And he raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. And it is important to remember, Lord Jesus here is at the very center of our thoughts. Because he raised the Lord Jesus because he is the one who brings us peace. Isn't that right? And we see it again in that the fact he is the one who is the great shepherd of the sheep. What is the point of him being the great shepherd of the sheep? Well, he's a shepherd because he is near to his sheep, isn't he? It's not only that he has power, but he is nearby. You know, my, I was over with my mummy last week and she wasn't too well on Friday. And we had to call the ambulance for and take her in the hospital. But 
reality was, the only reason I could help her was because I was there. The only reason I could help her was because I was here. Normally, I'm here. I would only hear after the event. She would have had to call one of my sisters, and they would have called the ambulance. But it was on this one occasion we could do this. It's not like that with the Lord Jesus because he is never far away from his people. He is the great shepherd of the sheep and he is a better shepherd than David ever was. And the, the writer of the Hebrews prays to the God of peace because he is the one who raised Jesus up to be that shepherd, to be that one who is always near, who is always directing, who is always soothing, who is always healing, who is always feeding and who is near enough to his people to be able to help. Not only that, not only is he a great shepherd, but he is the mediator of the better covenant. And this has been a real theme throughout the epistle to the Hebrews. It's about the new covenant of God with man that is found in Jesus. And he is its mediator. He is its high priest. He is the one through whom it came to be. We are in a covenant relationship with God if our faith is in Jesus. An indissoluble covenant relationship with God. God has promised that he will forgive us for our sins, that he will sanctify us, that he will bring him to himself, to himself one day, that we will be forever with him in glory. This is our new covenant, all founded on the blood of Jesus Christ, better than anything the world or religion can ever offer. And here we see why the writer speaks and prays to the God of peace because he raised Jesus and Jesus is the one who is powerfully present with us in our difficulties. This is important for us to remember, Christians, because we pray for the God of peace to come, not because it motivates us, not because if we get the words right and put them in the right order, it, it forms some sort of magic formula or magic spell that makes things happen. That's not what prayer is. In prayer, we go to the one who loves us and cares for us, and we ask him for what we need. We go to him, recognizing his authority and our subordination, his strength and our weakness, his understanding and our foolishness. But we go to him knowing that he makes the difference. We, know, we go to him knowing that he has the power to work in us whatever situation we find ourselves in, that he has the power to guide us and lead us and feed us in that situation. We go to him because we know he's not so far away that he cannot hear us or see us or care about us. We go to Christ. We go to the God of peace knowing that he loves to give generously to his people in accordance with their need. We go to our shepherd because he is near us. And we have a relationship with him that cannot be broken. We go to the Lord Jesus because he teaches us what no one else can teach and reaches us where no one else can reach. Jesus is our God, our Father, our Shepherd, our Comforter, and he is never, he is never absent. He is never distant. He is never uninterested. He is never unwilling. And so, whenever trouble comes into our lives, whenever conflict comes into our thinking, whenever we're facing the dire circumstances of the day, we know that we can pray to the God of peace. And we know that he is the one who is near to his people and he can help. It's so simple, isn't it? And this is something that is a privilege for the believer. It is not for those who are not saved. It is for those who have their faith in God. It's those who have their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because, because the peace that he gives is found in obedience to his command and, and, and in relying on who he is and in understanding who he is. And the Holy Spirit does this work in our lives. Friends, not only do we have the powerful presence of the God of peace but we have the powerful purpose of the God of peace verse 21 says this it says he will equip, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever amen what does the writer of the Hebrews pray for these people they're in turmoil they're finding the way difficult they're, they're struggling 
And he prays for the God of peace who has the power and the presence to be able to come and to work in them in their situation that they're in at that very moment. And what does he pray? Does he pray that they're ejected out of that situation? No. Does he pray that everything will all be... No, he doesn't pray. He prays that they will be equipped for every good work. That they will continue to serve God even in the difficulties they find themselves in. That God will work in them what is pleasing in his sight. What he wants for them. This was a prayer for God to use these confused people. Use these conflicted people. Use these worrying people for his glory. To work in them so that he could transform them. And make them useful in the kingdom. What a prayer to pray for anyone. What an exciting prayer to pray for anybody who we know our love. How would it change our personal lives? How would it change our fellowship life if this was the type of prayer that we prayed for each other? If when we met one another on the street, if when those names popped into our minds during the week, we were praying that not that that person would be rich or successful or whatever it is that we pray for, but that God will be at work at them and work at home, wherever it is they find themselves, that God will be equipping them to do his commands in the situation that they find themselves in. In school, that they would experience God at work in their lives, making them useful in the kingdom. To, to me, this is, a, this, a, this is an amazing prayer, isn't it? This is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. This is a wonderful gift that this writer is giving to his people and which we can give to each other. In the morning, when we're, uh, or whenever it is that we're doing our reading, our quiet time with God, to pray for our brothers and sisters like this. What a gift that would be for the day. If when we were listening to our favorite songs and, the, and, the, and those ideas were coming to our minds and we're, we're, we're hearing the truths coming through in the song and then somebody pops into our hearts and we prayed that for those people. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were so confident in our fellowship with one another, that we would be confident that every day this little group of people were praying these things for everybody else. Tell me something. Would, God's, would God refuse? Would God not answer? Would Christ not listen? Would the Holy Spirit not draw near? I think that would be unimaginable. Because, of course, it's God's purpose to use us for his glory. That's why we're here. We're here to tell the world about Christ, about the gospel, about how God loves them, about how God's calling them to himself for forgiveness and salvation, how God has come to eradicate the war that exists between them and the Father. And to bring peace in their relationships with others. By giving them confidence to follow God. Friends, is your peace under attack today? Maybe you're sitting here and maybe, I can't see if you're smiling because you've got your mask on. But maybe, you're maybe when we talk, yeah, everything's going really well. Yeah, life's good. Yes, I'm managing, I'm, I'm working my way through, I'm not really sure what's going on, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident things are going well. But maybe inside you feel like you're on holiday and you're in a prison cell and everybody's speaking in a different language and you don't know what's happening. Well, friends, your God is near and he is the God of peace. 
And when you ask him, you're calling on the one who has the power and the proximity to do what you cannot do to help you. You have the one who is determined to use you for his glory. That's why he saved you. That's his very purpose. And when you ask him, he will use you for that purpose. And, and what's more, whenever you look around at all those places, even if they're not willing to share with you the, the, what's troubling them, you can pray this for your brothers and sisters. You can use this. Another prayers that we find in the word of God and other truths that we find in another to, to, to actually minister into the lives of the people around you. This is something that's so important and sometimes we miss it, don't we? Part of what it is to be a church is to minister to one another. It's to bless one another. It's to encourage one another. It's to look out for one another. But so often we miss it and, and given our current circumstances, it's even more difficult than it normally is. And we have to make sure that we don't fail to do that. But one way that we can do it, we often talk about how, how unsaved people cannot stop us from praying for them. They can tell us not to tell them about Jesus. They can tell us not to tell them about the cross. Yes, they can say, but they can't stop us praying for their souls. And that's even more powerful. It's the very same. Maybe they don't want to burden you with their problems. Maybe they don't want to tell you their struggles. But you can still pray for them. You can still pray. You can still seek God for them. And I must say, as the minister of the church, I would appreciate that more than anything else in this world. Because I know that I need that. I need the God to work in me more than anything else that I could ever imagine. Today, as we bring our service to a close, let us let us determine in our hearts to be men and women who seek the God of peace in our own lives and in the lives of others. Let us make it our mission, our task and our joy. And let us see uh, what God will do. Let's, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are the God of peace. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that we will always be people who seek your peace in times of hardship. And may we experience that peace every moment of our lives. Amen. Amen.